episode 50 of Let's Talk Bitcoin for October 15th, 2013. Visit us at letstalkbitcoin.com for our daily guest blog, all our past episodes, and of course, tipping addresses. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today is our 50th episode. That happened fast. Thanks to everyone who's contributed to the show. Thanks to you for listening as we talk about the philosophy of payment systems. The conversation we're having is one that's changing the world, and just by listening, you're self-selected as the early 0.01%. Thanks to everyone who's tipped, and if you haven't, I can't think of a better time than our 50th episode. Enough of that. Today, we're in Georgia. We start and finish the episode with a large roundtable show including Peter Serta, Jason King, the Life on Bitcoin's couples, and many more on the morning after Jeffrey Tucker's cryptocurrency conference. A mix of speakers and attendees joined us for this, and the conversation goes really all the heck over the place. Sandwiched in the middle of the roundtable, we dig into my interview with Kathy Reisenwitz, one of the speakers and roundtable participants in the first of our conference interview series. Video conference passes from the cryptocurrency conference are now available with the introduction and keynote by Jeffrey Tucker and the first hour long panel is available completely for free. For nearly six hours of conference talks, lectures and speakers, visit BitcoinVideoPass.com. Enjoy the show. It is 10 a.m. Georgia time, <laughs> day after Jeffrey Tucker's cryptocurrency conference. And today we are joined by a whole variety of people for what is going to be the uh, essentially round table wrap up on what is a very small table <laughs> for this conference. Um, my name is Adam B. Levine. We are once again on Let's Talk Bitcoin. And uh, we have a lot of people here. So I'm going to let us go around the room, starting with you, Peter. My name is Peter Shorta. People call me the Bitcoin economist. So that's what I am. Um, uh, Jason King from Sean's Outpost, uh, Satoshi Force of Bitcoin 100. Elizabeth Flochet from Bitcoin Magazine and the Bitcoin Foundation. I'm Zachary Silva, student and Bitcoin enthusiast. Uh, Igor Gambitsky, online education manager at the Institute for Humane Studies in Virginia. I'm Kathy Reisowitz, Young Voices Associate, editor in chief of Sex and State, and writer at Reason Magazine. I'm Becky Craig, part of the Life on Bitcoin team. I'm Austin Craig, also part of that Life on Bitcoin documentary film project. You know, I mean, so I've been to a bunch of these Bitcoin conferences, and I know that there's a mix of first-time, you know, conference attendees here and people who have been to, to a couple of them. Jason, I know you've been to pretty much everyone. That, wait, did you go to New York? You didn't go to New York. You didn't go to New York. You didn't go to New York, but we saw you in San Jose. Yeah. A lot of times we, we go to conferences that have more of a investor-tuned sort of theme or, like, talking a lot about the regulatory stuff. This conference didn't have any of that at all. Yeah. I mean, so... so Generally speaking here, themes that emerged during this conference, well, what do you guys think? What was the what was the big takeaway from it? Well, what I liked is that um, there were a lot of people here that um, I wouldn't have considered, you know, hardcore Bitcoiners that were here more because there was a, they were had an economic interest or financial interest in it. And they were just like, this seems like it could solve so many problems. I want to go to this conference and see what it's all about. And I thought that was really awesome. It's a big anarchist contingent. That was cool. <laughs> the Americans contingent. There's definitely there was definitely a lot of that. So yeah, I mean the, the libertarianness of this conference certainly was contributed to by the speakers that uh, that Jeffrey Tucker invited. Kathy, this was your first uh, Bitcoin conference. I mean, what did you think? And did this differ from other types of conferences that you've attended? I thought it was great. I'm used to going to libertarian conferences and tech conferences from when I did internet marketing. So this is a great combination of the two. One thing that I really loved was how much we all learned from the participants. I mean, the questions were excellent. Um, we had participants clarifying points and bringing up really interesting topics, so I really enjoyed it. Peter, you gave a lecture on Bitcoin as sound money. You know, I mean, that's a that's a controversial topic among certain uh, parts of the Austrian crowd. You know, I mean, do you think that that's some place where where the Bitcoin community or the cryptocurrency community broadly is making headway on? Well, I think that. Uh so far, there hasn't been much research in this area done from the Austrian school, and uh, my uh, what I would like to achieve is to motivate others to do more research and to build on top of what I and uh, others like Konrad Graf and say produced. And uh, at the after conference party, I was approached by a guy who works for the Mises Institute, and he said that. Uh, He's uh, also a Bitcoin enthusiast and they're trying to do something, so maybe something will happen. So maybe a sea change is coming. 
it's good. So, Peter, when you say research, do you mean like peer reviewed or just kind of more? I mean more theoretical research. There is a whole bunch of empirical research, but the real deep theoretical Austrian stuff that there wasn't really much of that one. I think that one of my favorite moments from the conference was Jeffrey Tucker's opening keynote, actually. He's a really interesting guy, a lot of character to him, and again, he's sort of one of these almost, you know, I guess cult figure has an odd connotation to it, but it's like, if, if you know who Jeffrey Tucker is, then you like Jeffrey Tucker a lot, but if you don't know who Jeffrey Tucker is, then you don't know who Jeffrey Tucker is, and it seems like there's a large contingency of that. You know, I mean, certainly this was a more libertarian event because of that, and I think I saw more bow ties here than I have at any of the other, <laughs> any of the, the other events. But I mean, were there, you know, I mean, what was the thing that made you go, it was worth coming here for this? And this doesn't necessarily have to be the conference either. We're talking necessarily about, you know, the interactions, because certainly some of the most valuable interactions that I had were at the party, you know, last night at the, uh, at the after event. So, I mean, Jason, what, what, was, it, what was it for you? Um, my favorite moment was actually talking to Peter after his speech, and I actually came up to him sort of fanboying to be like, hey, I really, really dug your speech, and I'd like to talk about alternative currency. And he's like, don't you remember we talked in San Jose? And I was like, I don't remember you and my family. He's like, no, we were just like part of a mob walking, like Bitcoiners walking to a restaurant. We started having a conversation about homelessness. And like, I remembered that conversation, and it was just like, didn't know who I had the conversation with, and he had remembered it, and it was like, it was really cool. I think just talking to people um, after the conference and hearing all the different creative ideas to promote decentralization, whether it's um, e-commerce platforms or just new um, opportunities and to see um, you know people already starting to collaborate after the conference and finding developers or business partners right here. I found the conference overall to be very interesting. I unfortunately missed the opening section of it because I actually drove it woke up at four in the morning and drove in from St. Augustine, Florida, six hours. <laughs> so cool. but overall like the conference like the conference was fascinating from start to end. Um, people or like the interaction was great. I personally am very much a fan of the libertarian environment here. You know. But so, like great experience and it's going on next year it is going yeah all right yeah <laughs> how's another one that has the this, another year been announced yet that's what jeffrey said oh great i haven't heard that that's fantastic all right well i'll be here next year so and listeners you should be too <laughs> <laughs> this is maybe something that a lot of old-time bitcoiners would probably already be aware of but it was news to me i gathered this from both the talks and from personal conversations with people here i didn't realize that cryptocurrency predates bitcoin that was a new concept. I didn't think that, I thought the publishing of Satoshi's paper was the birth of cryptocurrency. But Stephen at BitPay said he's been studying cryptocurrency for 20 years. And I stopped him and said, really? You mean, was, did you mean you've been studying alternative currencies for 20 years? No, I've been studying cryptocurrency for 20 years. The difference is the decentralization. I mean, like that's the thing that Satoshi really introduced to the party. And I think that that's the thing, I mean, in the past, that's the thing that that's been a sticking point because you can always shut down, you know, a company, you can always shut down. It's much more difficult to shut down a protocol. I think that's very important too because, um, you know, people are like, well, Bitcoin's brand new. I was like, yeah, but it's also, it's an iterative improvement on things that we have been doing for decades now. And so, like, to hear that quantified is pretty cool. There's something that I saw on YouTube. It was an interview with Milton Friedman where he talked about uh, someday we'll have a widely adopted electronic money. And I thought he was being so prophetic, but I suppose those things were even in development at that time when he was still alive in the early 90s. Not something I would have anticipated or really thought possible. But it's definitely been a theme in science fiction for a while. Like if you think about like Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash, things like that. I mean, a ubiquitous decentralized currency was always part of the world, you know, and it, it transcend and like especially that specific book, it being able to transcend so many different uh, nation states because there like there are tons of small little nation states in that book, but everyone's got a ubiquitous currency. So it was cool to see that that was in that realm, but at the same time that there was you know hard research research going on right and, and so this is completely blowing my mind and uh, in fact there's something happened like th so this is my first uh, uh, Bitcoin conference and I knew about it as a fringe something that just seemed like just a fringe fad but over the course of this conference it just kind of really woke me up to the rich intellectual tradition that's actually like evolving through uh, 
these Bitcoin uh, like experiments, this experiment with, uh, you know, how, uh, how we can interact with each other, the idea of like just revolutionizing, just surely using technology to solve problems of information in currency exchanges is something that now it seems like it's incredibly important for me as a libertarian. And that's the space I'm in, libertarian education, to really pay attention to what's happening in Bitcoin and how it can really change the relationship between man and the state. And so that's something that, that happened over the last couple of days. Yeah, from thinking like, oh, Bitcoin, that's an interesting, cool thing to like see that this has like ramifications for the future of humanity. Right? And, and, and so I had the same feeling as someone that was already in, like involved in Bitcoin, um, the smart contracts issue, the thing about being able to, to it solve some of the issues past the currency problem, um, that really was brought home to me this weekend. It was like, wow, like there really are all these opportunities out there for fixing so much of these broken systems. Right. And all be engaged in cryptocurrency. Right. Very much so. I mean, the TCP IP analogy really is yeah, a good one because, great. you know, nobody knows. I mean, nobody's using TCP IP explicitly, but we're all using it through the services that have been built on top of it. And so, I mean, that's an interesting question is, you know, is, you know, in the future, will we have, will we still trade Bitcoin or will Bitcoin just be the pipes that run underneath everything and, you know, or some other sort of cryptocurrency? And of course, that's something else we're going to go around the room and talk about is talk about whether or not the innovation is, is Bitcoin or if it's cryptocurrency broadly. We chatted with Tony at BitPay right after we got here, right after we flew in Friday afternoon and sat down, had a conversation with him. And one of the things that he said that really I had not considered before was that people would be using cryptocurrency, but they'd have no idea that that's what they were using. They'd be using the tools on top of it um, and that it would be reaching out to people who were unbanked or underbanked. And these are ramifications that, that really had not occurred to me. Yeah, John Stahl from uh, the Bitcoin Foundation, actually, yeah, he was like, I think that we should actually uh, punish people who use Bit or Coin in their company. <laughs> because in a couple of years, Bitcoin's going to be so ubiquitous that like, you know, you having to come back and tell people that it's about Bitcoin, it's not going to matter. So it should just be about, you know, the utility of the transaction. Right. And like, we're like, this is definitely Bitcoin, guys. So I thought that was really interesting. That that marketing idea of having Bit or Coin in the name is an interesting phase that we're in with the development of the Bitcoin economy. I feel like people are doing that now so they can draw on the new audience of the Bitcoin user base. But if it's going to grow and develop, it definitely needs to move beyond that. And from my background is in marketing. Don't do that from a marketing perspective. I guess you can, but it really pigeonholes what you're able to do if your name is Bitcoin Ski Mask Shop dot net or something like that. What was your joke about Amazon? If Amazon If Amazon been- was Online internet bookstore.com. It would be really hard for them to have become the Amazon that we know today. Well, I, I think there's a real world example that I think uh, Zappos was initially uh, sneakersite.com and they actually were like, well, we're going to be completely pigeonholed here. So, like, within the first year of operation, they're like, we have to have something a little more ubiquitous. Exactly. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. We're having this conversation on a show called Let's Talk Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple of months, I've been thinking about that name. It's all cryptocurrency. Yeah, I know. But it just it doesn't roll off the tongue it's quite true. well. So I mean, so I'm, I'm still waiting for the for the word that replaces cryptocurrency to kind of LTB, come up. man. I think you know, yeah, you know, that whole you know, like sci-fi sound, just like Sydney. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree. But yeah, no, Austin, your point is very, very well made. I think that you know, my background before getting into the Bitcoin space was in the environmentally friendly food service packaging space, which is to say the green space. And so you know, the company that I was with was called Excellent Packaging, but every other company that we interfaced with was either green or bio bio or earth or all these other things and you know very very quickly and we were already seeing it in bitcoin certainly it's hard to keep track of these names i mean the the pigeonholing is one side of it but also they're just bad names because they sound like everybody else i really liked your point austin about the unbanked populations that are being helped by by cryptocurrencies i think um i heard jeffrey tucker talk about people in nigeria who didn't have access to credit, don't have access to a stable currency, but are buying and selling in Bitcoin. And I, I think that's something that we don't think about as people who have access to other ways to buy things. It's the importance of expanding that access to uh, to the third world. And it's not just third world. I mean, we, we have over 35% of Americans are unbanked. So I mean, right here in, in quote unquote, the first world, we have huge portions that are essentially third world here within America. So, I mean, Bitcoin can reach out right here to America to do that. Absolutely. And obviously in Africa and other places as well. 
You know, it's funny, that enabling argument, I think, really works well for, uh, for unbanked populations. But, you know, I recently spoke with Jaron from Coin Center, and he made the case that, you know, eventually it's going to be banks that are using uh, Bitcoin as their underlying infrastructure and that people generally won't make person-to-person -person transactions because we live in a world that is surrounded by these, these know your customer requirements and that even though they used to be true, you know, it used to be, there used to be thresholds below which you didn't, you know, have to have to have that stuff happen to you. Now those thresholds simply don't exist. And so every transaction, no matter what the thing, has to have this identity associated with it. We're obviously speaking with a fairly libertarian oriented crowd here. What do you think of that idea? Is there any is there any conflict in that with banks using Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as the underlying protocol? Would, would there be a regulatory conflict between that happening and people who are unbanked using the same protocol? No. Could the environment arise where those two are at? Well, this well, is more of a UN. Every, every homeless guy needs to register as a money service business. <laughs> 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 right, but wouldn't that be so cost and time? <laughs> yeah, that would be cost and time and uh, expertise. Uh, that's, that's an obstacle that if you're trying to figure out where you're going to sleep tonight and, and how you're going to get some food, the, the last thing you really need is paperwork work. It's not something that I think any of us really look forward to. Do we see a time when reg the regulatory environment gets such that people can't legally use cryptocurrency or Bitcoin maybe? Well, I, th I think we're going to go through a growing pain here. I think I, I, don't, I don't even want to give a time frame, you know, maybe five, ten years where it's going to be this like weird amalgamation of legacy regulators trying to figure out a way where they could stamp down on it. But that's going to be coupled with the fact that you can't, I like the, the quote from this weekend that you can't really hold a gun to algebra, like the, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, Bitcoin is going to end run around pretty much any, any uh, attempt to regulate it, that, you know, Bitcoin is going to sort of work around it. It's like, you know, and the internet looks at censorship as damage and routes around. So I think Bitcoin will do a similar thing. So what, what I think we'll see is I think we're going to see this sort of murky area in the next five or ten years, but ultimately, maybe hopefully, what we'll see is government's going to have to start competing. Like, if government wants to stay relevant, the government's going to have to start competing like a startup has to compete in a marketplace. And so if they really want to show that they should, that they have value, then they're going to have to be like, okay, well, you know, we can provide better value and they're actually going to have to prove that and Bitcoin's not going to let them just be like, no, you know, everything would fall apart if you didn't have us. It would be like, well, we have all these other services now. So I, I think that's ultimately where we're going to be headed. Maybe that's me being optimistic on it, but I, I definitely do think the next five or 10 years there's going to be this murkiness of them trying to regulate something, figuring out how they can sort of box up Bitcoin and like Bitcoin's never going to be in the box, you know. And okay, and so this is okay. Every single time I hear you speak, or I hear like these Bitcoin intellectuals speak about like the the future, and, and just it is so inspirational. I felt so inspired during the conference, especially hearing about all of the social good, all of the charities that are set up. I think it was BitPay that was setting up a foundation. Big give, yeah. Big give. And then what you're running, you know, a, a Bitcoin funded uh, homeless shelter helping homeless people in in Florida. It's it's incredible that we're building alternative structures to government institutions that we kind of look for to provide these services. And I think providing them better, like startups, going through iterative processes Absolutely. and being very accountable directly to the funders, right? Not not taxpayers and bureaucrats, but people who are giving without a third party arbiter, money to actually directly invest into the social good. Okay, so I can actually give you a specific example of how like like Sean's outpost in Bitcoin just like destroyed the existing legacy architecture there, which is we had a homeless girl that we were helping who got a disease called Guillain-Barre, which is a terrible nerve disorder. And, uh, and if you can imagine it's terrible if you have a home, it, it is just devastating if you're in the street living like in an old boxcar in the woods. So. Um, we pushed her through the system of, of getting uh, emergency disability. And so for this is a young girl, you know, fairly attractive 26 year old girl who went from being able to run around and jump from train to train to being essentially paralyzed and living in a box in the woods. So, I mean, there's a, like, a lot of issues with that. So emergency disability was 90 days. So there was 90 days where she went from like after she left the hospital to where like we were having to come out and check on her absolutely every day and make sure and try to leave someone posted so that she didn't get abused while she was out there. Well, 
you know, 90 days was actually unheard of. Like the disability lawyers were like, you know, we will be lucky to see this money in nine months. And so we got it in three months. We we're all super happy. And so she had a check. This is a check backed by the United States government. And um, so she didn't have an identification. So we had to go we had to have an argue. We had to go and argue with the DMV. And that was, you know, a couple of hours before we could convince them just to give her an ID to cash this one check. And then once she had a government issued ID, a government issued check, we went to five different um, banking or monetary institutions and they all would not cash the check. And it was because she's homeless. So when they run a base credit profile on cashing it, like one of the things that we don't think about is having a permanent residence is a huge portion of your credit profile. So she was getting kicked back as unable. So this is literally a government backed institution for the government safety net of how they're supposed to be taking care of disabled people. And with five institutions, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, PNC, Walmart and like an ace check cashing place all would not cash this check. And we finally had to go to like a usurious like mom and pop check cashing joint where they like charged 6% of the check to uh, uh, for a, a para, you know, a paralyzed woman to cash her government, you know, check 6% after being denied five times. And I was just like, you know, like if they would have just paid in Bitcoin, like this would be done. Like, you know, there would be no wait time. There wouldn't be any of this crap. And so it's, it's those kind of things where it's like, for instance, like Wired did a piece about some guys that we help. When people send donations to those guys, they get, you know, their support is instant. And this was 90 days plus all this hassle for the legacy system on it. And going forward, I don't. I think that there would be no way for literally government to compete in that market, and that if they, they're going to have to compete because it will become a market for those sorts of things. Which, by the way, the government's trying to shut down those mom and pop places, the last refuge. Awesome. Yeah. So great. Which, well, um, it makes me wonder, you know, you're saying the government's going to have to compete, and now my bias is going to show wide open. How on earth can they compete when you have this fast, nimble, independent uh, group of people using this wide open protocol and the government's business is regulation. How on earth could they compete with that? I think they're probably probably going to try to continue to box it, as you said, and, and into fail. perpetuity, yeah. continue to try to shove this into a box. And then they're going to end up like so many governments around the world that technically the government still exists, but in practice that they're, they're just impotent. I mean, they're not going to have the ability to control it at some point. But that story is such a call to arms because that's our safety net and it's completely... And it's not a safety it's net. It's not acceptable yeah. and we need to, to form, to build an alternative. We need we need something else and that that's what Bitcoin can be and that's what we need to give to you and that's what we need to create like now. And the, and the craziest part was is that the, the existing sort of, you know, uh, stewards that walked through this, like the you know, social security lawyers and civilian lawyers, they were all like, wow, 90 days, that's amazing. Wow, that's so great. I'm so happy for you that it only took 90 days and that she didn't die in 90 days. That's awesome that she's still alive to get this money. That was a good outcome. Right. And that was, I was like, wow, this is the positive outcome. Like how many people like never see that check, you know? And how many people are not seeing that check and we don't know anything about them? We, right. we sit absolutely. here in comfort and think the safety net exists and it's sufficient and it's not. It's absolutely true. I think that that kind of brings up an interesting point. Um, recently, there's been a lot of focus in the tech space that's not Bitcoin specific about the idea of being able to have ubiquitous sensors in the world and being able to tie those what those sensors generate to identity. And it's an interesting question because the problem, again, that you ran into, Jason, was that her identity wasn't sufficient for what they wanted it to be in order to give her permission, you know, authorization to have this money that was, that was hers, right? So, I mean... Is money something that we should have identity connected to in the first place? Is, is that a valuable service at any level anymore? You know, I loved Charlie Sherb's comment on this when he was talking about the reboot of BitInstant. He's like, you know, I think legacy banking, like out the gate treats you like a criminal. And then it's up to you to prove to them that you are not out to just rob them blind. And then it's, it's like, you know, we try to like extend to you that like it's not that big of a deal. We don't want all your information and and. You know, yeah, if you're going to do a huge volume, we're going to need more information on you at some level. But for you to just try to act, you know, $500 a day in Bitcoin, that was not a day, whatever their bottom level is. I mean, that's, I think, more than most people would need to transact in a day for a very minimal amount. 
Um, I think that that's a really great step on their part. But no, I don't think that a financial transactions entity need to be doing. I mean, it's a proxy, right? Yeah. So you're trying to figure out the whole the whole credit score requirement. Trying to figure out if you have a home is a. We're trying to predict whether you're going to be willing and able to pay to pay. And so what's what's awesome, and that like what we didn't talk about, but sort of is there, is that one of the reasons that banks have that issue where the, you know, they they want to make sure your identity is is because they actually are on the hook for it. I mean, whether or not we should give a crap that they're on the hook for it is another conversation. But like you know, you could fraudulently produce a check, and like maybe that check won't get funded. So maybe they need to have something. But like the fact is, if I send you bitcoins, I can't get those bitcoins back. Like you have those bitcoins. There's you don't have that you know that risk. So because that risk is completely mitigated with Bitcoin. Like, I, I think that we should be able to, to at least loosen some of this IT requirement. Absolutely. This is digital cash. It's a different dynamic. If you're dealing with cash on a day-to-day basis, the person who's taking my cash at the corner grocery store doesn't ask for my identification. Exactly. Um, this is the digital yet. equivalent. Yet. They don't ask yet you. ask for that. Um, that. That ID requirement shows up when you have much larger sums and it's not a cash transaction. Uh, just by virtue of the fundamental dynamic, I don't think that that identification requirement needs to be there at all. But making cash transactions makes you suspicious in our society. Yeah, using large cash sums, suddenly you're suspected to be a criminal. How on earth could you have gotten $10,000 and why are you crossing a border with it? And we're going to take this from you for your own good. Don't be a food co-op in America. Don't be a food co-op that takes cash. That's just problematic. You are listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin, the premier audio cast providing news and insights that cover the rapidly evolving world of digital money. Our twice weekly shows include analysis of late breaking news, updates on key technical, business and regulatory issues, and in-depth interviews with the key people driving the new digital economy. Let's Talk Bitcoin offers sponsors an attractive way to reach a targeted and savvy audience. For more information, email sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com. More than 300,000 users and counting trust blockchain.info. It's a Bitcoin wallet service and a wealth of Bitcoin information and is completely free to use. With a blockchain.info wallet, you'll get the convenience of a web wallet and the security of a desktop client. Blockchain.info is also a block explorer. You can use it to see Bitcoin transactions in real time, check the balance of any Bitcoin address, and view many handy Bitcoin charts all for free. See what they have to offer today at blockchain.info. I'm joined by Kathy Reisenwitz. Until recently, she was a digital publishing specialist at Reason Magazine, and now you're an associate at YoungVoicesAdvocates.com. I- I'm not actually familiar with that organization. Can you tell me what you do there? Thank you so much for having me on, Adam. So Young Voices is an outfit where we try to connect young people, so young professionals and college students, with the mainstream media to get their views represented in the news. Does that work? It's been working pretty well so far. Um, We're in talks with Al Jazeera right now, Al Jazeera America. Um, We just got one of our advocates published in The Advocate, so that was pretty exciting. And we're plugging away. That's really cool. Al Jazeera has been sort of an interesting thing. I, you know, they they reached out to me too. It seems like they're a lot more open to these to these alternative viewpoints than than a lot of uh, the the domestic media is. Kathy, you've been a libertarian activist since university, but you now live and work in D.C. When you first began your career in activism and education, did you see a revolution likely to happen in money and? Basically, what I'm asking is, did you see something like Bitcoin even as a possibility? When I was in college and first getting into liberty, I definitely saw a revolution happening with money because I remember the passion around monetary policy that the Ron Paul candidacy created. Uh, kids were really motivated by the message of, in the Fed, um, stop the, the slow erosion of wealth and savings, um, especially for young people who were dealing with uh, graduating into lots of debt and not lots of jobs. They were very concerned about how they were going to be able to build prosperity for themselves going forward. I did not at that time see cryptocurrency on the horizon as any kind of solution to that. It was very in the Fed, gold standard, you know, change the way our government deals with money. 
but this is far more exciting to go around the government and deal with the problem of sound money ourselves. It's really an interesting idea to be able to denationalize money. Jeff Fong recently wrote about that for Let's Talk Bitcoin and the idea that you know, I mean, and Jeffrey Tucker spoke about it yesterday, too, you know, that Hayek looking forward, you know, predicted actually that this is something that could happen, but he couldn't predict how it would happen because the technology simply didn't exist. So it's been really interesting to see cryptography kind of come into the mainstream and really be able to pick up on on these various ways. It seems like when you're in the minority of I don't know if I want to say the culture. I don't know what it is about libertarianism that seems to be. I mean, it's certainly a growing movement, but we're still definitely a minority within within the space. And so you kind of have to think outside the box. You kind of have to, you know, look for other solutions. Do you think that that, you know, Bitcoin is the start of a trend of alternative solutions or do you think that that it's hard to do this? I think that Bitcoin is part of the general trend toward how the market solves problems. So one of my favorite quotes is by Henry Ford, and he said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And what that means to me is no central planner, no individual could possibly predict what the market will provide to solve the problems that it's allowed to solve. And so I think cryptocurrency is an absolutely perfect example of there's a problem of unsound money. Nobody could have predicted that this is where we are in solving that problem and no one can possibly predict where we'll be in a few years towards solving that problem and what that solution will look like. So many, many libertarian supporters are supporters of hard money and yet Bitcoin is this really controversial thing in a lot of libertarian circles, even though it seems like there's this natural proclivity towards it once you understand it. Do you think that this is a problem with comprehending it and being just generally skeptical about new things? Uh, because, I mean, again, you, you look at the you look at our current monetary system and compared to the hard money system, it is a very new system. So innovation is not necessarily good. So I think that the difference between a focus on sound money and a focus on alternatives um, has to do with are you focused on the problem of the state or the solution of the market? And I think that we need both. We need people who are focused on how government is messing up our money supply and and what can be done to make that better. But ultimately, uh, that's not going to be the solution. The government, we just need to get it out of the way. And what will ultimately succeed is going to be, I think, alternative currencies. But I also think that it's kind of a a difference of levels of risk aversion. I think people who are a little more risk averse are going to be more interested in making sure that the government offers a gold backed currency and people who are a little more into high reward are not as focused on that and want to just get around that and um, get in early on alternatives. The idea that either at an individual level or at a country level, you know, on a nation state level, you could see a cryptocurrency based standard either with cryptocurrency being used as the currency or with cryptocurrency being used to back a currency in much the same way that a gold standard would back a currency, except that it doesn't have a lot of the problems that a gold standard does. It doesn't have the transparency issues where, you know, it has to be hidden in order to be protected. There there are kind of two questions here. Do you think that, first off, something like this can be allowed in the world that we live in? And secondly, Do you think that in the world that we might inhabit in the future, do you think that something like this can happen on a nation state level or does removing the power from from the political structure, is, is that is that anathema to the structure? So I don't know if this is going to answer your question completely, but um, feel free to follow up. I ask hard questions. (laughs) Well, something that I've been thinking about for a while is um, how the nation state will will look in the future. And I think that one thing that's going to be extremely uh, world-changing is going to be the continued irrelevance of geography to economies. Um, so what I mean by that is it's, it's not going to matter where people are as far as how they do business, who they do business with, uh, you know, where their customers are. None of that's going to matter because it's all going to be online and we're all going to be connected through that. And so as that becomes true competition for where you're going to set up your business. So the laws that you have to live under uh, is going to increase, right? So like, for example, um, I'm an entrepreneur and I want to start a business. You know, only I need to live in this place because all of my workers can live wherever they want to and all my customers can live wherever they want to. And so um, I think 
as competition between nation states or you know entities that provide property rights increases, then you're going to have uh, competing monetary systems and competing systems of law, which is going to be amazing for freedom. You know, we already basically have that. <laughs> I live in California. The company that uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin is formed in is based out of California. But I think that I'm the only person in California who actually, you know, draws any sort of any sort of compensation from it. And everybody else is either in a different country or we have a we have an editor who lives in Michigan where, you know, the cost of living is a quarter the cost of living in California. So I definitely can see that, you know, it seems like a lot of the problems that we have in society are based around the idea that the people who make decisions aren't actually responsible for the actions that their decisions incur. And it seems like to a certain extent, Bitcoin can actually help us with that by further removing the power from from the, from the people so that they don't have to be responsible, but at the same time, they don't have the control. I guess that's the thing that I keep coming back to is that you don't necessarily have to have control, but if you have control, responsibility seems like it has to be baked into the cake. And that's not the system that we live in now. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. And that's kind of part of the point that I was trying to make with my talk is that governments are experimenting with currencies, but somehow they're not taking responsibility for the experiments gone awry. And that's what's so beautiful about cryptocurrencies is that everyone who participates is responsible for how it all shakes out. They can't put that on anybody else. They can't force it on anybody else. It's you're in. You do what you need to do. You see what happens. So uh, speaking of your talk, at the conference, you gave a talk called Why a Free Society Needs a Free Money. For those who weren't able to attend, can you kind of give us your argument in a nutshell? Sure. So my talk was, was basically making the point that drawing an analogy between what everyone who's playing with Bitcoin is doing is they're participating in an experiment. So uh, what that means is they, we, nobody knew how Bitcoin was going to shake out, whether it was going to work, that it was going to work this well. Um, but they got in and they tried it and they saw what happened and they shared what happened. And through that, we've learned an incredible amount about cryptocurrencies, about online currencies. Some of the questions that I asked that Bitcoin's answered is, uh, can you provide transparency but still be trustworthy? Um, can an algorithm limit inflation? Can wildly fluctuating value make it unusable? These are all incredibly valuable things to know, which we found out. And I was making the case also that uh, governments also experiment with currencies. So the Weimar Republic, Chile, Zimbabwe, uh, all instances of hyperinflation, all experiments gone awry. But then on the softer end, you have the experiment with the euro, which we're seeing how that's worked out with the uh, money grab in Cyprus and the riots in Greece. Um, and then in America, we have our experiment with an expansionary monetary policy that's causing a long, slow erosion of wealth and savings. So understanding monetary policy and currencies as experiments, it's obviously much, much better to allow individuals to experiment to benefit from what they're learning, to limit the risk to only the people who are voluntarily experimenting than it is to force entire countries to participate in experiments where the consequences of an experiment gone awry are uh, wide and 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 forced upon people. So, but isn't that, I mean, like we in here in America, we have the Obamacare argument continuing to go on. I think we're in year two or three of it now. A big point that that has become pivotal is that everyone has to participate. And even if you don't participate, you have to pay in because lacking that, the system doesn't work. Isn't that just as true with currencies? I mean, like if people were allowed to voluntary, voluntarily pick currencies, doesn't that mean that they wouldn't use the bad ones issued by governments? That's exactly what that would mean. <laughs> okay. So, but I mean, but I mean, the thing that I always get to get back to is, is how do we get from here to there? You know, I mean, like there, there's obviously so much potential here. There's so much that could be done. But the people who have the ability to do it have none of the incentives that make them want to do it. And the system doesn't doesn't, you know, hold them responsible for anything like we were talking about. So how do you get from here to there? Well, what I exhorted uh, Bitcoin enthusiasts to do is to not just experiment, but also to join me in the fight for the freedom to do so. So the first thing that we can do is just fight back against all um, seizures and encroachments on our tools of experimentation. Uh, the Silk Road um, 
seizure of more bitcoins than have ever been seized before, things like that. We need to uh, to to protest those things and say, you know, um, just you know, setting aside monetary policy, you know, just let us experiment, just let us have our money, so that we can find out what we need to find out about it, and then if it works, let it grow, and if it doesn't, let it fail, but just let it happen. Right. Well, this is the argument I think that libertarians have been making about the market now for about very, very vocally for about five years. And it's getting even more vocal as we continue to go down this rabbit hole and nothing seems to be being fixed, even though we keep doing the same thing. Um, You know, talking about the Silk Road, you know, yes, there's an element of experimentation there, but also, I mean, it was a, a market where you trade illegal items. And so, you know, wrong or right, those are illegal items. But at the same time, it brings up an interesting parallel because the Silk Road did not create a market. The Silk Road serviced a market that, that already existed that simply didn't have a good way of, of conducting commerce online. And, and that, that conducting of commerce online actually seems like it has advantages in illegal markets because it limits the contact between people, for better or worse. So Silk Road solved the problem of violence in the drug trade. It didn't limit contact, but it did move that contact online. And so instead of broken kneecaps, you had bad user reviews. Instead of armed robbery, you had bitcoins not being released until the goods arrived. And so this idea that we're going to shut down Silk Road to protect people is absolutely ludicrous. This was protecting people. This was solving that problem. And uh, I just can't believe that they would they would shut it down. Well, you know, I mean, at the same time, though, you look at what's happened recently with marijuana policy, and there was recently a ruling passed that said, I I don't remember if this was a state or federal, that said that dispensary, I think this might have just been California, actually, that said that dispensaries um, were no longer allowed to hire armored car companies, (laughs) right? So they're no longer allowed to use armored cars to transport funds. So, I mean, it seems like the government doesn't want to protect certain types of people and actually is, is just okay with them, you know, having problems. Well, it would seem like they would want to shut down the solutions to preventing violence in the drug trade, which is that needs to give you pause about their true desire to protect people from violence. (laughs) One of the kind of uh, recurring topics is Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Because a lot of people think that Bitcoin is cryptocurrency and other cryptocurrencies, they're basically, you know, like experiments and the U.S. dollar, you know, in much the same way that Bitcoin is an experiment relative to the U.S. dollar, which which I think is sort of downplays any potential impact that they might have. I'm wondering, what do you think is the innovation here? Do you think that it's Bitcoin or that it's cryptocurrency as a class? I think it's cryptocurrency as a class, but I wouldn't want to downplay the importance of the first most successful cryptocurrency. But I think ultimately innovation don't stop. Like this is the beginning. So Kathy, you're also the editor in chief of Sex in the State, which is a website where you write about the topics of sex and power. Your writing has also appeared on a number of other libertarian and libertarian leaning sites. If someone would like to to get in touch with you or or see your work, where can they find you? Thank you so much for having me, Adam. I really enjoyed it. So um, check out Young Voices Advocates at youngvoicesadvocates.com. I'm on Twitter at at Kathy Reisenwitz, C-A-T-H-Y-R-E-I-S-E-N-W-I-T-Z. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kathy Reisenwitz. And um, please read my blog, sexinthestate.com. We look forward to catching up with you at the next conference. DNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB. Hi, this is Jason King, founder at Sean's Outpost, and you are listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. Sean's Outpost is a homeless outreach in Pensacola, Florida, and we are proudly powered by Bitcoin. To date, over 13,000 meals have been fed to the homeless in our area, all purchased with Bitcoin and through the generosity of the cryptocurrency community. 
Read more about us at seansoutpost.com. Food, shelter, Bitcoin, everybody. Seansoutpost.com. So I think that uh, just about everybody who's here traveled to be here. So I'd like to go around the uh, the room and, and say where everybody kind of came in from and how long your journey was to get here. You want to start, Peter? I live in Vienna, and my journey was about 12 hours of flight plus a bit of connecting time. <laughs> um, I'm from Pensacola, Florida. It's about five hours to so. <laughs> For myself, this is the first Bitcoin conference I didn't need to travel to. I live in Atlanta. Uh, I drove in from St. Augustine, Florida. Um, it was about six hours. Uh, took a two-hour flight from uh, Reagan National Airport in D.C. Same, but I'm from Alabama, so it's great to be back in the South for a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had like a four-hour flight and then about an hour or so of frantically running around the airport trying to find a way to pay our way out of the airport on Bitcoin. So it had a little time, but not much. And then a lot of walking as well. Get here. So I wanted to ask you about that. You guys have had a very interesting journey. And I think that a lot of people really look at, at your project as like a milestone. You know, just like I think that the, uh, the reporter for Forbes who tried to do the same thing in San Francisco, the idea of living on Bitcoin is on the one hand, one of those things where it seems like if we can achieve this, then it's a huge step forward. But on the other hand, it seems like we're really early in the process to do it. Why was this the time that you chose to, you know, they chose to embark on this? Oh, I absolutely think that this was the time to do it. If we had tried to do this a year ago, I don't think it would have been possible. I think Jeffrey Tucker said you'd be dead in a ditch. You know, we're resourceful folks, but if the resources simply don't exist, it doesn't matter. Uh, if there's nothing to use, how can you get by? And right now, the, the resources are still scant, but growing rapidly. Uh, we saw a lot of interest in Bitcoin last spring when there was the rally up to 250 dollars And we've seen mainstream interest in the subject continue to grow. It's, it's more and more every day outside of the Bitcoin press and more and more in the mainstream press in a way where we're getting comment on it from high level executives and government regulators. People who, who otherwise would not be interested in this weird niche thing, but because it's growing so rapidly, suddenly people are taking an interest in it. And people should be taking an interest in it. The architecture of it is such that it's going to, I mean, I think we all agree in this room, that Bitcoin has a bright future ahead of it. There's a middle ground between there not being any really, really any resources at all and, and it being way too easy. If we'd done this a year from now, I don't think anybody would have thought anything of it. If we'd done it a year from now, people would say, well, that's, that's, that's a great hard. point. And I'll, I'll just come out and say I was a skeptic of what you guys are doing to start with. And it's just because there's so many Bitcoin products. Everybody's got an idea, you know, and like uh, so you have to kind of sit back and see how people prove yourselves. And like over time, you guys have definitely proved yourself to me. What you've done, I think, is just a huge services. Um, people that have been in the Bitcoin space for a while, we tend to think like, oh, we're already here. Like, look, everything's still like, it's been great, man. You do whatever. And you guys are like, no, you see all this, these gaping holes that are still here? Like, it, and like, I think that's awesome because people are like, oh, dude, there's totally a niche I can go fill. I can totally do this. Like right now, if I, I would be like, you know what? We got to get a major petroleum producer online with like that. That's the hookup right now. So we need to get a major gas station that'll take Bitcoin and make it where you can travel ubiquitously around America with Bitcoin. I think that's, I think someone needs to be on that right now. And the holes in the Bitcoin system reveal the holes in our system. So yeah, you're totally. talking about all these gas stations being owned by the same company. Mm-hmm. That's a problem in society, not just with Bitcoin. Absolutely. Same goes for cell phone services. You know, yeah. there are like four providers and if they don't take Bitcoin, what do you do? Yeah, well, and I think I think uh, that was really cool because Charlie was like, you know, we're, we're rebooting Bitcoin wireless, right? And like we've got all these providers online. Not only are you going to be able to have cell phone service, you're going to have to have you're going to get cell phone service at a discount if you pay in Bitcoin. I was like, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I'm um, I think uh, like a far-reaching app or implication of like a major brand gas station or major petroleum company to start accepting Bitcoin would be, well, obviously others would follow. And long-term, it could possibly mean that petroleum sales are dictated in Bitcoin. And so, I mean, if you want to just talk about that one thing, we're talking about saving just tons of money from a corporate standpoint is that um, fleet management is just a nightmare. It's like making sure that your trucker has access to a debit card that you are a credit card so that they can continue to keep rolling. Like just being able to ubiquitously like fund a wallet from wherever you could just make a phone call and they could just fund it and pay for transaction. I think that that would streamline that process so much. 
and that there's a lot of savings there because there's you know there's a lot of overhead and, and you know credit card transactions and stuff sort of the stuff that we all know about the Bitcoin business. But I think in that specific market, there's a huge value for it. I love the point about credit cards aren't designed for the internet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point that came up a couple of times at this conference was this idea, you know, I mean, that diner's card from the 1950s that was, you know, like the prototypical, what then has become the technology that we use to pay for everything on the internet. It's, it's a very interesting point. Peter, you've been traveling around to lots of different conferences over the last couple of months. What's the vibe outside of Atlanta? What's the, you know, are, are these different? Are you having the same conversations at every one or are there different perspectives? I think it's, uh, it might sound surprising, but I think actually in the US it's probably the most, uh, one of the most developed and widely dispersed network of Bitcoin businesses and ideas, even though the regulatory environment here is probably the worst in the whole world. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but uh, it's it's not just like because it might be potentially easier in other countries to do that. Maybe even in other countries there are less problems with uh, getting a, a bank account and uh, having a debit card or something. What currency covers? I, I, well, I think that, you know, in the United States, even though it's a heavy regulatory environment, I think we have uh, sort of a, a startup's tradition of bucking a regulatory system. And if you look at something like Airbnb or Uber, places that like went in, they fixed a problem, like technically they were illegal, you know, that they, were, they should have got it. But they sit there and they showed value in a system so much that the regulatory environment is already there. The regulation had to morph to let them in because people were like, I know, I want to be able to run out of my spare room. I don't want to have to go through all this crap. And I think that um, I think that there's a lot of room for Bitcoin to do similar things in the U.S., even though it is sort of, you know, technically a tighter environment here. I think that's a lot of the value of people that give from starting a Bitcoin company. Well, you know, we were having this conversation last night, Jason, about how, because we were talking about this, you know, how like, at the same time, Bitcoin will be adopted other places faster, but to this point, that hasn't really been the case. And, you know, and I think my argument is that we have the luxury here. A lot of, you know, people who are at this conference have the luxury of being able to travel to these things, being able to spend the time doing these speculative things and really proving out the models that actually works so that the people who don't have that luxury can then just take the stuff that works and adapt it to their situation exactly and just, you know, hit the ground running. On the subject of, this is backtracking the conversation a little bit, but you were talking about how uh, we need to have Bitcoin businesses that don't have Bitcoin in the name. You know, you'd asked about, is this the right time for our project? I, I feel like we have to do this project now and we... Becky and I are trying to reach out to an audience that uh, is beyond the Bitcoin community. I want this I want this documentary film project to appeal to the Bitcoin community, but if Bitcoin is going to find wider adoption, if it's going to really develop as a usable currency, I feel like it, it has to be something that people outside of the technical or the libertarian communities find and see and understand the value of. Didn't you see some statistic that like Bitcoin was the highest search or Utahns searched for Bitcoin the most on Google. Something yeah, more, like more than any other state in the union, apparently Utah has the highest search volume for Bitcoin yeah. on Google. Which is cool. So I think we're, we're getting there. We're getting people to, to see it and ask about it. Because it's not about Bitcoin. It's about reaching unbanked communities. It's about stopping you know, monetary inflation and uh, allowing people to invest and have real savings and, in, and incentivizing uh, investment. It's about getting around the regulatory state. You know, it's about these other things. Bitcoin is a tool, so um, it needs to be thought of and branded in that way, not as like a thing itself, but all the problems it solves. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Bitcoin is a means like that. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I, have a, I have a really amateur question. Uh, is, there, is there any role of banks in a Bitcoin economy? Yeah, I think that arguably there is. I think that... Um, you know, the traditional role that banks served as the actual guards and protectors of wealth, I think that there's definitely still a place for that. Because ultimately, not everybody wants the responsibility of having to manage all of their wealth and having to make sure that it's protected and kept safe. I think that the interesting part about Bitcoin is that you don't need the banks to do that. Yeah. But you can use them if they want to do that. Now, the things that banks can't do is they can't do a lot of the fractional reserve lending. You can do fractional reserve lending. It's not to say that it's impossible with Bitcoin, but it is to say that it's really, really risky in Bitcoin because the counterparty risk 
is something that doesn't go away no matter what you do. Ultimately, if you can't you know, enter something on a computer and create more Bitcoins like you can with the conventional banking system or you know, dollars with the conventional banking system, then it's very, very difficult to do these sort of fractional reserves. So just on the fractional reserve topic, because you know, fractional reserve was brought up in the conference and um, didn't get to really talk about it as much. So, but doing fractional reserve banking like it's done with the US dollar, I think it's going to be very difficult with Bitcoin. But we also do fractional reserve with precious metals here, which is like, which is a good commodity fractional reserve, I think it actually might be worse. So like for instance, like if I buy a contract for like 10,000 ounces from a commodities broker, in three months that contract comes due, they actually expect me to, to just like roll that over or take my profit, but I can actually go, no, I would like to take possession of my town, I would like to take delivery of those 10,000 ounces. Well, if you do that, Brinks or whoever's got like physical actives, that's gonna freak out. Um, and it's actually like, I have a story from Roberts and Roberts, their awesome pressure metal exchange in Pensacola where a client did that and it actually took them about three months after the contract to take possession of it. And when they talked to the bank, they're like, well, we had to clear all of those bars off of other commodities contracts that we had sold, which means that they had cross collateralized the same bar. So you could do that with Bitcoin, you know, like, oh no, we, we have possession of this Bitcoin and you could just show someone a Bitcoin, a wallet, you know, if you were to do it the same way that we do precious metals. And then even that serial number on that, that piece of silver, uh, is unique, you could write the same zero number on different commodities contracts. And as long as the people holding those contracts didn't know that it was cross collateralized, you could have that fractional reserve. So I think what will happen and what will make it more difficult is that I think that we need to be more vigilant about building a system where that kind of stuff won't happen, where we can say we have some sort of system that's like, no, that's already on a contract and you can't do that. Because it's hard to do with a physical piece of silver, it's not hard to do with a big well, I think it's that hard to do thing. That's the that's like the most important part there is that with precious metals, there is a meaningful cost associated with taking that delivery, with not just rolling it over because then it's just profit. You make whatever profit you're going to make. Yeah. That's it's easy, it's clean. You roll it into more, you roll it up. But if you take delivery, then that's a lot of physical goods you have to take possession of. It has to be delivered. It has to be stored. It has to and, be and they count on that. They count right, on that. Exactly. So can, yeah, that's how it works. But, I mean, but it's, it's how very similar to the argument we're just making about how our credit card was not designed for the internet, but we use it like it is anyway. Like as Bitcoiners, we have to. We we can't just make the Bitcoin system about like like be the Bitcoin version of the systems we already have. We have to leverage the ability that Bitcoin has in a brand new way. We, it would be very easy to just do the exact same thing as we do with precious metals right now with Bitcoin, but we don't want to do that. We want to do something completely different. But it's actually, I mean, I hear what you're saying. Okay, so what's the hardest thing about Bitcoin right now? Converting into and out of other currencies that are not cryptocurrencies, right? So given that that's the hardest and most expensive part of the entire Bitcoin ecosystem, all of the incentives say that if you do something like, you know, buy a forward contract or sell a forward contract, you should expect that they're going to want delivery of Bitcoin because simply put, it's the most efficient, cheapest and fastest way. I agree. But I think I think the point that you're missing right there is, is that like we're all extremely technologically adept when it comes to Bitcoin. Everyone in this room gets it. OK, but if you just have some institutional money or you just have some investment money, you're just going to call your commodity broker and say, hey, I want to get involved in this Bitcoin thing. And and so I think that right now there is uh, there is the potential for that to be abused, whereas a legacy person who was like a legacy commodities broker could transact Bitcoin like that. Um, and then people that aren't aware that Bitcoin is as easy for a person to take where it could be abused like that. Sure. I feel like we will probably see cases of that sure. shortly. I think it's plausible. So uh, just some final wrap up questions. First off, is anybody here involved in mining or have you ever been involved in mining? As of yesterday, yes. <laughs> um, we just got that Jupiter. So you guys later? Yeah, we cool. got a Jupiter. The, uh, Alex from KNC Miner flew one here for the conference. We set it up at the, at the front and played or ran it a little bit yesterday, and it's been running in the hotel room all through the night. <laughs> um, so uh, at the Bitcoin meetup prior to it, I was having a conversation with someone about the, like, the theory of mining Litecoins. And I was like, but I've never actually mined. And the guy literally walked up to his car, walked back in, and like put a Radeon 7950 Sapphire in my hands. It was like, now you're a miner. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, we only been running it yesterday, but I'm still last night. I couldn't stop staring at it, just staring at this machine that was running, driving the Bitcoin economy and somehow magically, mysteriously making us a profit in the process. So did you plan to buy this or did you see it when it was here and you're like, we should probably get we we planned on it. Okay. We were planning on getting one, but KNC, they're a sponsor of the project and uh-huh. they wanted to make sure we got one quickly. And so they said, We'll bring you one out there. And we said, Don't worry about that. They did it anyway. <laughs> uh, so I certainly am quite happy with what you would call customer service there, at least for the for the KNC miner. And I imagine it's probably this way for a lot of the ASIC miners that people are buying. The reason I didn't get into mining two years ago when I first started learning about it is because it was beyond my technical capacity. And the KNC miner last night, we pulled out of the box, we plugged things in where they fit, and we saw some lights and fans turn on and suddenly it's going. It was not a technically difficult operation. Well, that's awesome because to this point, it really has been. That's why I've stayed out of mining is because I don't have the time to learn all that stuff. Uh, Last question. Actually, I want to start with you in Austin because I think you might have a different perspective. Does the price of Bitcoin matter right now? Uh, Yes, the price of Bitcoin matters. I feel like the way Bitcoin was designed, and I don't know if this was intentional, I kind of have to assume that maybe it was, is Bitcoin is, is rising in value rapidly early on. And that makes a difference because then people like speculators We'll look at it and say, hey, there's a great opportunity there. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to buy into this this cryptocurrency that otherwise is such a niche thing that if it wasn't rising in value, why would they get on board? Uh, Why is my father-in-law, who's retired and in his 70s, interested in Bitcoin? He otherwise would have no interest. He heard about it from us, but if it wasn't rising in value, it never would have caught his ear. Because it's rising in value, it's something that he said, hey, maybe I should make that part of my you know, high-risk portfolio for my retirement investments. We chatted about it. He decided not to, but he really was considering it. That rise in value is something that makes a great deal in, I hate to say it, the marketing of Bitcoin. It spreads word fast. The reason the mainstream media is picking up on this is because it's an investment opportunity. And then later on, obviously, that's going to taper off. But I feel like this was designed so that it would drive adoption quickly early on. And then it could be a usable currency later when value stops rising so rapidly. I think it's important for what it says about other countries and other currencies. So I think what happened with Bitcoin in Cyprus was... Bitcoin revealed what was going on. And so everyone paid attention to the money grab in Cyprus because it caused a Bitcoin boom. And so the rise and fall of of Bitcoin um, shines a spotlight on um, the deficiencies of our current system. I would definitely say that the price of Bitcoin does matter and there are stronger ways coming out, such as BitShares, to determine and weigh out the price of Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin matters to me uh, because unlike most people in the space, I have to sell Bitcoin all the time because uh, like people have to eat regardless. So like I'm I'm very sensitive to what the price is because um, you know I've I've had those days where um, we took a dip and I had to buy food anyway. So like I've you know I've sold at seventy when like it had just been over a hundred and like so I definitely feel the price price point. But I think ultimately the price doesn't matter. Well, as an economist, I would uh, maybe counter intuitively say that it doesn't matter. It depends on the context, but for economists, a lot of arguments that I've heard that it needs to be like this, it should be volatile, it should be deflationary, that's, it doesn't matter. I think volatility, I think like something like BitPay manages the volatility very, very well from an emergency standpoint, so I think that we can get a lot of utility out of it regardless of the price point. You know, and I think that the Cyprus solution, um, this is not with regards to the uh, to the financial crisis that was happening that, that, that occurred there and is still kind of ongoing, but actually to the solutions that uh, Michael Hill and Danny Brewster have come up with with their NEO and B kind of paired projects that are both a Bitcoin bank that's going to have physical locations and a, um, and a payment network that will utilize a very, very modern debit card style uh, style you know things for very low transactions I think that um, their their model mostly is to denominate accounts in the local currency 
And so they completely take the risk off of their users. And that's, you know, that's a that's a bad thing, but it's also a good thing. So I mean, so I think that, you know, and that's something that we've done with Let's Talk Bitcoin. Our the way that we're doing our e-commerce is we're letting people put money into our system at whatever time they want, and they can spend it immediately, or they can just let it sit there at the fixed value while we've taken on the exchange risk. So I think that there's a lot that that, that the that the volatility is gonna find the people who actually want the volatility. And that the people who don't want the volatility will be able to, to hand it off and it won't actually cost them anything. They won't stand to gain from it, but they also won't stand to lose from it. That's a very interesting situation that I don't think we've really had before. Oh, it's a market. <laughs> Imagine. What? <laughs> yeah, the big share of the options and short and long does just that. It separates the volatility between those who want to speculate and take the risk and those who want a cryptocurrency that's paid to the dollar without any risk. That's Daniel Larimer of Invictus Innovations who just walked in at the last minute here. So that actually wraps up our roundtable. Uh, once again, I'd like to really thank everybody for uh, joining us today. This was a fun conversation and I look forward to doing it again next year when we come back for the conference. But once again, thanks for listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. We'll see you next time. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> the easiest roundtable I was ever on. <laughs> Thanks for listening to episode 50 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show is provided by lots and lots of people. Additional editing was provided by Matthew Zipkin. On location engineering by Crystal Levine. And music was provided by Jared Rubens. Video conference passes are now available with the introduction and keynote from the cryptocurrency conference and the first hour-long panel available for free. For nearly six hours of conference talks, lectures, and speakers, visit BitcoinVideoPass.com. 